Hello friends, we've had great questions about what sword style do you guys practice at your dojo? Every dojo out there has different styles, different teachers. I have had several different teachers from different sword styles that we've incorporated in our particular school here. But make sure that you check with whoever your teacher is, where their credentials come from, where their background is, what teachers they've trained with, and how it might apply to modern self-defense. Now the first thing I want to say is why bother training with weapons, as people ask, is because it, it makes your martial arts so much better. I believe that if you're training without weapons, you're not really doing a true Budo. Uh, in my opinion, weapons give you skills that other martial arts don't have. Any type of environmental thing that you can use for your own self-protection or your family's self-protection. If you don't understand about footwork and timing and distancing, depending on what tool that you're using, you're at a huge disadvantage. If you only work one part of Budo or one part of martial arts, which it might be just grappling or just striking, just kicking, just throwing, just weapons, you want to have a rounded curriculum so that you get a taste at least of the different types of Budo and uh, different types of martial arts. So uh, below me I have some swords which we'll show. Uh, these are just a couple that I got out to represent the different styles of Budo and the different styles of Kenjutsu and Iaido that we teach here at this school. But again, your school might only have one or it might have several. The first thing you need to ask is what period of history are we talking about because depending on the period of history in Japan depends on the type of sword that they used or what type of arms that they used. So that's the first thing you have to ask yourself is what period of time are we working in? Are we working in the Sengoku Jidai period where it's all warring states where they had mostly spears, naginata, horses, full yoroi armor or are we talking about the Edo period where it's more the Tokugawa peace time and there are just you know there's no more you know, day-to-day -day war and there's more of ronin or masterless samurai walking around in uh, kimono with no armor. They have a different length of sword. Did they have one or two swords? There's so many questions to ask. Are you talking about giant cavalry type of battles where you'd use an odachi or something uh, or a nagamaki? These are different things that you have to ask. In this school we teach several different sword styles. I've had training in several different sword styles, but let me show you the first type of sword that we use. So this is an odachi or no dachi. Uh, they're interchangeable. So odachi and no dachi, it's contextual how you use the word. Uh, o means big and no means field. So what type of sword was this? It was a field sword. But if you're talking about the size of it, it is an odachi or large tachi. So odachi refers to the length or the size, because there are some odachi in Japan that are seven, eight feet long in shrines. They, they made them a lot for religious purposes. But this would have been a field battle sword, and it might have been worn on your back if you were on horseback. You probably would have already had it drawn out. It has a massive blade massive handle. So this is just a huge battlefield sword. This one's about five feet in length, but look at the size of the suka handle. As you can see, it's massive. Obviously designed for two-handed combat. So if I was teaching the Kuki Shinden Ryu style of sword that we teach here, this would have a disadvantage because it's so heavy that you guys all know out there that if I miss a swing, I'm now open for attack with someone with a faster weapon. So this particular style would have been used probably on horseback uh, or you might have had a, a squire that already took the scabbard off for you and you would go into battle with this or it was carried in your hand into battle. Again this is an older style sword much bigger, much harder to make, harder to maintain, harder to carry, impossible to conceal hard to run through woods or river with this thing on you. So this would have been just a utilitarian no dachi sword for field battle combat. 
Now, in Aishin Ryu, which I studied, or a Muso Jikiren Ryu, uh, this would have been impractical because that particular style deals with Iaido. But this is a large battlefield sword. How cool is it? This one has a black blade. I don't know if you can see that. That's really cool. There's a black blade there. And you can buy these online. So people always ask, where do you get those? Just, just Google search. Google is our friend. So any of the swords that you see, I have about 70 or 80 here at the dojo hanging on the walls. And then I have probably another 50 at home. Uh, but all of them were attained, you know, when you start at age nine in martial arts, you attain a collection. You don't need more swords. One good sword's enough. But over the years, I've collected so many because I've been around a long time. So you just tend to buy a couple swords every few months, every couple years, and you invest in them. Uh, and you just pick up a large collection. So that would have been that style. Tenshin Shoden Katori Shinto Ryu is another style I, I learned as well as Tamiya Ryu. This would have been more for the Tachi. So this is a Tachi. Uh, this would have been worn probably with the blade down on your belt and you can see it has hooks here for ropes or uh, chains to go against your obi belt. Uh, probably drawn in a different way because of the horse's head here. You'd probably have to draw this over your head because the sword, uh, the horse is right in front of you. But these had a larger curve on them than the katana. Typically, uh, they were made different. They had different fittings, probably longer, heavier, different type of steel depending on the period. We teach this from the Kukishinden Ryu, which was a 14th century sword school. So we would definitely teach this called Hapo Bikenjutsu, or Hapo Hikenjutsu is one of the styles that I teach here. And that has to do with the secrets of the sword. So there's a Tachi. This one's all in gold here with gold wrapping Sukuito there. It's a beautiful sword. Here's the blade. I don't know if you can see that. Kind of a dull hum on there large kisaki at the end. This one doesn't have much of a curve, doesn't have much of a curve to it. So the sword depends on the sword type. But this is a beautiful sword and we do do this particular style in here. Again this would have been the Sengoku period, the Jidai period of warring states where you had horses, cavalry, bigger swords, armor, completely different sword styles teach things with armor. Katori Shinto, uh, hyo Hyo Niten, Iten Ryu. Let's see, here's a katana here that's sharp. It's a Shinken blade. This would be good for cutting or stabbing, but with armor, this would just deflect off of a lot of armor. And that's what the armor was designed for. It was designed not for the sword, but more for the spear, because the spear was the most vicious battlefield weapon of all. So if you ran up against a guy with a spear, even with armor, if he hit the chest plate here, he'd go right up into your throat, or in some cases right through it. But certain sword schools that I learned depend on stabbing in the chinks of the armor, you know, the weak points of the armor, the Kyusho. And so we have specific targets. And even with the Aido that I do, uh, I have specific targets that we attack. Whether you are in armor or not, they are vital points with a lot of blood flow, a lot of blood vessels or they're designed to hack through, I know it's gross, hack through certain ligaments so that you can't use that hand anymore. But can you imagine running up against a guy in armor? It would be very hard to break through that. So the spear or the naginata or the nagamaki perhaps, or even a tanto, you know, if you can get in one of the crooks under the mempo or behind the helmet, under the armpit in the butsumetsu, under the legs, certain areas that you had to keep open in order to move or to go to the bathroom or to turn your neck would have been vital points. But again, every type of sword school, let me show you this one while I have it out because I know you want to see the sword. So this here is a custom katana. Um, it's about a 13 inch handle there. This is in gold again or brown. Tsukito, it's got a Musashi Tsuba there. Razor sharp, 
The hamon is straight on this one, as you can see. There's no wave to it. Hopefully you can pick that up there. It's a nice sword. Extremely sharp. Extremely sharp. I would not want to fight someone with that. Okay, so this would have been the, um, the Muso Ryu or the Asian Yu that I studied. We would use this sword. Also with the Kukishin sword, Skui would use the Katana, which is a much more modern, if you want to call it modern sword. So the Hiken no Ho, um, if you were working with a ninja sword, a Shinobi Katana, um, it's really no such thing as a ninja sword, because if you had a sword like this, which is what people call a ninja toe, which is a modern invention, probably from the Kabuki theater, a Chokuto straight blade. This one's based off of the Shokosugi sword. This would not be carried around, in my experience and knowledge, in old days Japan, certainly not in public, because you'd stick out like a sore th thumb and you'd be arrested immediately. Perhaps they had, you know, uh, straight, shorter swords. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, historians fight about that. It really isn't important. Important thing is to know how to use this on the mat. Um, but this would have been considered a, uh, well, it's considered a modern ninja toe, but uh, a real shinobi katano probably would have looked like this. Would have had a long handle would have had this kind of rose petal guard which is almost square but again you want you would have wanted to blend in with the other samurai so ninjutsu is a sub art of bujutsu ninjutsu is the art of stealing in infiltration intelligence gathering espionage but a ninja would have been operative of the samurai class so here you have a shinobi katana much shorter blade as you can see shorter than the saya, about six inches shorter. The reason for that is so that you could quick draw this. So the, one of the ninja hikan or ninja bikan, the secrets of the sword, is the idea to really draw very quickly to get that sword out faster than the other guy who had a longer blade so that you could kill him quicker. You know, there's stories around that in the Bansen Shukai that the ninja used to use the larger guard so they could step on it to climb up walls and things and then you would take the, uh, the sagio out the string here and put it in your mouth and then lift you know you'd step on this climb the wall then pull the sword up by the cord so you wouldn't lose your weapon there are stories that the blade was made short in the saya so that you could hide things in the end of your scabbard there secret messages perhaps metsubushi blinding powder all kinds of different things you can hide down there. But you can see this is much shorter. So this style is what I teach here, which is a different sword style from the Tagakure Ryu, the hidden door school. We have, uh, let's see, in the Kukishin sword style that I teach here, there are nine techniques. However, Hidari Migi have, that instantly makes them 18. There's a, a Henka variation, which makes 27 techniques. And then, of course, knowing martial arts like you guys, some of you don't know that it's limitless. Depending on my distance, type of weapon that I have, the 27 techniques could turn into hundreds. In the Togakure Ryu, there are about seven. But again, left and right makes 14. Depending on your distance, forward, back, times that by three. So if you're using a Shinobi Katana here, you now have minimum of seven to nine techniques times three left and right forward backwards what type of length do you have what type of clothing do you wear all these things determine what type of style we're teaching at the dojo then we have an entire set of techniques for the shoto which is the short sword or the wakizashi so this shoto here would have been the companion sword of the samurai this could have also been a ninja sword. A short sword could have easily have been used by an operative because it's easily concealable to carry around. 
can still get the job done with a 20 something inch blade here sharp as can be short handle you can still get a lot of leverage with this you can use it one hand or two handed so to me this would have been a more realistic shinobi katana than the ninja toe that you see from the movies but we have an entire set of techniques with this weapon because this does not rely on strength it relies on speed think of uh, the Lord of the Rings you have like Glamdring that huge long sword I don't know if that was Gandalf's sword and then you have Sting which was Bilbo's sword or Frodo's uh, that little tiny blade there would have been much faster much quicker so you'd have to close distance so we have techniques on how to get close to the opponent because this wouldn't work far away you have to get in quickly and use the sword to block and move in same thing with the ninja sword if you had one of these shinobi katana doesn't matter if I use this as a prop this in our excuse me in our togaka that you is used more as a a rod it's used as a hitting weapon it's used like a hammer so often you could use either side of the blade the sharp or the dull side to bash the opponent in armor and then get that tip into the neck where you need it to go a straight blade if there was such a thing wasn't as good as cutting as the curve however you could easily hack someone's arm off with this easily with good technique I could talk about this stuff all day uh, I love it but going back to the Kodachi here where is it so many swords so little time here it is Shoto so there's an entire set of techniques we teach at the dojo for this weapon we also teach uh, Tanto Jitsu Tanto as you know is the small dagger that the samurai often carried in their obi belt more utilitarian but this could be used for the coup de gras could be used for ground fighting if your sword was broken in battle all you had left with you was your tanto you better know how to close the distance and take someone out with one of these this is a practice tanto it's not sharp so this is what we use in class we use this last night as a matter of fact against the hanbo but the beauty of the kukishin is if you study it it's, it it teaches a lot of different things the kukishin teaches a lot of taijutsu but it also teaches bojutsu with the six foot staff hanbojutsu with the san shaku bow which we used last night in class or the hanbo some people call it the half half staff or half stick sojutsu spear naginata jutsu kenpo sword arts and heiho which are military tactics all of those are included in the kukishin which is one of the nine lineages lineages that we teach here at the dojo most schools that I know have one lineage. We have nine, so it's an incredibly rich, lifelong, cultural thing that you can study till you're dead. That's what I love about this martial art. When I studied so many, which this was the only one that had the depth to it, that others paled in comparison. I did judo, I did aikido, karate, and they were good in their own respect, but they only had part of what I was looking for. They were really good at certain things and they had massive weaknesses at others. No weaponry, no mind science, no ground game in several of them. But you could get really good at kicking, punching. But if you want to be a tatsu gene, a fully actualized human being, you got to pick an art that you can study for 50, 60 years. Not one that you get bored with after five. Swords are always dropping. It's another thing, when you drop a sword, don't let that go to your head as, oh my gosh, my sword fell. As a collector of swords, use them as tools only. Unless you have a sword that you intend on passing down as a hereditary item, an heirloom, let this just be a simple tool. I break swords constantly. I've broken literally dozens of them over the years, whether it's training and you bash a boken and it breaks in two because the grain wasn't right, or you're using an aluminum alloy blade which bends at the drop of a hat or the suka breaks in half which has happened the sword itself snaps in half with even the nicest of steel don't 
treat these like they're better than humans. They're just a tool, so if you lose it, if it gets rusty, as you can see from poor, I didn't take care of this particular sword very well. So when I went out to practice at night, you can see that this one is rusted. Do you see the rust? That is from lack of oiling the blade and wiping it down. I don't care. Now this is a $500 ninja toe sword that I got from China, based off of Shokosugi. But the fact that it rusted, I don't lose sleep over that. This is a tool. It's a hacking tool. So when I go out and cut in the woods, or I do a Tameshi Giri with it, I don't care if it gets messed up. Now some swords that I have that I paid eight, nine hundred, twelve hundred dollars for, I will take the time, oil them, not touch the blade, take good care of them with their open grain so that they don't rust. But this one here is a it's it's a hacking piece. It's a machete. Don't spend too much time focusing on the beauty of the sword. Okay. Now I know I'm getting off thing off track here, and you're probably bored. Tanto jutsu. So here's a shinobi uh, tanto based off of a match of that one I just showed you. That's a nice little blade right there, isn't it? Look at the way that. Teardrop Saya has that wrap on it. That's really cool. So here is a sharp tanto. This is a straight blade. Again, that would not have been, been common back then. They would have been curved. Square suba. Playing kashida at the end. Beautiful hamon. This is a handmade sword, hand metal, uh, definitely folded. You can tell by the grain. It's a beautiful hamon. This is one of the sharpest swords I own. Beautifully sharp. That'll cut you like anything. But we have an entire curriculum that shows you how to use knife fighting. Modern knives, obviously, you would carry a pocket knife, but we show you how to defend yourself with that because people don't carry swords nowadays, but millions of people carry a pocket knife. And again, we have gun disarms because Thousands of people carry pistols, especially here in America, we're obsessed with guns. But you can see my point about this, which, you know, to, to even ask, what are we going to work on tonight? Well, what style of sword do you want to do? Do you want to do battlefield sword from 800 years ago? Do you want to do armor-based swordsmanship? Do you want to do Iaido, like you see in anime? Now. Because I've trained in a lot of different sword styles with sword uh, teachers over the years, like the Tamiya Ryu, the Katori Shinto, there's so many techniques that overlap. A lot of schools that you go to, the sword techniques are almost identical or there are small differences. So know that going into any martial art you study, a lot of these techniques. Again, remember, if you understand the history, after the warring states and the military kind of fell apart, uh, what did all these samurai who were professional military people do? Well, they opened sword schools. If you knew anything about the sword, you had no income coming in. The government wasn't paying for your food anymore, so you would have to teach. So all these sword schools really developed in this certain period of Japanese history. And hopefully they had people that would pay them money to teach. And that's where you get all these different styles of schools. But if they're around the same period of time, they often have almost identical techniques. I've seen techniques with completely different names in the kanji, yet they're the same basic kata, except the guy might move his left foot instead of the right, or he might swing from the left rather than the right, but they're basically the same. Now I've developed my own style of swordsmanship. I have my own style, so here we teach the kukishin, Hapo Hiken, or Hapo Biken, same thing. We teach the Togakure Ryu, uh, Hapo Biken from there, or the Biken Jitsu. And we have the Tono Ryu, which is based off of Musen Munen, Eishin Ryu, Katori Shinto, all these different styles that I myself have found over the years that I use. And maybe someday we'll make a DVD on that particular style, and that might be attractive to some people out there. A couple things I've learned from studying from all the different styles are there's a lot of politics. So if you go into a school where they are ripping apart the other 
sword styles, I would steer away from that. Remember, Hiken or Biken is, is keeping things secret, and I don't show all the techniques that I know to students until they get to a certain level. I'm certainly not going to show on the internet uh, the secret techniques. You have to come. Matter of fact, we have a seminar, as you can see the poster right there in two weeks, on the Ninja Biken or the seven techniques of the Togaka Deidu, which we're going to do out in the back field where we're going to use a shinobi katana like this one, shorter, against a katana. How do I use this to win against someone with a longer, heavier, more superior blade? How do I get close to the opponent? How do I use this like Gimli, like a hammer out of Lord of the Rings? How do I use the back end of it? How do I use deception by using the terrain and the environment around me so that I can overcome the opponent and win? That is in two weeks, but you got to be there because I'm not going to show that on the internet because that's reserved for people that have practiced, know how to hold the sword, know how to draw it, know how to carry it, uh, know safety with the sword. Those are things that we reserve for students who are in-house here, who have committed their time and in some cases their lives to this as I have. But when you go to a school to learn the sword, a lot of the techniques overlap. Try to stay away from politics. Hopefully you don't have a teacher that down talks the others because all the teachers have validity. All the styles have really good things about them. I see some sword styles that I don't feel are very practical if you want to bring them into modern knife fighting. So can I translate a 500 year old technique to use a small or a medium sized knife to defend myself? And get rid of the fantasy. Most of you out there who are young uh, probably either watch manga or anime or you uh, read books, saw movies through cartoons and things. You, you are not getting the reality of Kenjutsu. You are getting a Hollywood version which is full of misconceptions and myths and you have uh, Kuchibushi out there which are people who talk a lot but don't have any real experience. You have your keyboard warriors out there who like to type and show how much they know and hear, but they have no physical skills on the mat. Be careful of that. The real experts that I know are quiet, humble men and women that don't throw bravado out there, that don't attract violence. As a matter of fact, they repel violence, which is what Bu of Budo means, to stop a spear. Well, that's one interpretation because Budo can mean warrior arts, but the kanji in Bu, uh, Hoko for spear, and then uh, the other one can be Shi, which is foot. So it can also mean, Bu of Budo can mean to walk forward with a spear into battle, but it also means Harame to stop, so it can also mean to stop a spear, which is preaching nonviolence, which I like because it's positive. And the modern version is just war arts or military arts, budo or bu, bujutsu. Again, I'm getting off track. I could go on and on about this. But let's wrap this up. We have different swords from different types of uh, fighting styles, different periods in Japanese history or Chinese history, which is older. You have different lengths of sword, the odachi, the nodachi, the tachi, which was around much longer. You have the katana, which hasn't been around very long at all. You have the wakizashi, or the shoto. You have the tanto. We didn't even get into halberds and spears and things. The naginata, which is another part of the kukishinden ryu that we teach here. We have the sojutsu, the naginata jutsu, which is using huge, giant pole arms, long distance. Other than that, you have archery, which I don't teach. I do not teach kudo. I'd love to, but I never really found a teacher that taught me archery. I know archery, but I'm not good at it, um, but I don't have an actual Japanese teacher. They're extremely rare in the U.S. to find. There's probably some around. Those of you who live near a big city are usually more lucky in finding more options in martial arts. You don't have to have a big collection like I do. Knowing about a sword, knowing about this, and knowing the length and the weight, and the materials and all the different names is completely meaningless. That's what I meant by Kuchibushi, and I'll do a video on that. 
look, you can be an armchair warrior or a real warrior. And a real warrior to me are the people that show up at the dojo and they train two, three times per week. And they sweat and they bleed and they get headaches. Like last night when we did all kinds of rolling in ukemi for an entire hour we did ukemi. Those are the real warriors, the people like the military, those are the real Navy SEALs, you know, the real guys that go into battle, the operatives. Please, please, I implore you, it's very easy with the technology out there to become a keyboard warrior and someone who thinks they know. They're called a paper tiger, as my teacher said. Yet you get them on the mat and they have every excuse in the book why they can't train. They make up injuries and excuses why they can't train. They make fun of other people when they practice weapons because they say that's stupid and they're really ignorant about the depth of martial arts. So therefore they try to tear it down rather than physically bring up themselves, which is the goal of Budo. It's to make yourself better than you were yesterday. None of us are perfect. We wake up every day trying to be a better person. Therefore the tide raises all the boats rather than trying to sink that one ship that you're jealous or envious of because you just don't have the power in you to actually train. On that note, my friends, I'm going to go do some other work and we're preparing for a classical class tonight. Tonight at 7 we're going to work on uh, throws. We have a new crash pad, so now we can work on these huge judo throws. We can actually get air time and throw each other and land on a surface that's not going to hurt you. Even though our mats here are, are nice, to have an extra 18 inches of crash pad or foam so you can totally throw yourself, your friends, it's a blast. We leave here so happy to be able to know that we can do this stuff full speed. Can you imagine someone landing on the cement? Uh, it's very dangerous stuff, so we have to be very careful. But to have a professional fall guy crash pad that stunt people use. It's just a wonderful thing for your dojo so that you can actually try these throws out in realistic fashion. All right, my friends, I hope I didn't bore you too much with this. Some of us out there love this stuff and we never get bored. I'll sit there and watch a three hour video or a lecture on, on the samurai because I just love it. If you're still around, I hope you have a great day. I hope you can find a school in your area to train. You're always welcome to come to our dojo. If you're interested in uh, swordsmanship or kenjutsu, we have a few DVDs that we do sell through our website, thedojoinc.com, or you can download them if you don't want to wait for the DVD. The Ninja Biken seminar behind me that we're going to do, we're going to make a video out of that probably. We're going to film that, so uh, that'll be outside in the hot sun of September here in Ohio. That's going to be a blast because we're going to get down and dirty. And we're going to learn these seven katas and how to use the environment to take down the opponent. All right, my friends, you guys have a great day. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate you watching our dojo channel. Please subscribe to our channel and click the little bell so that you get notifications so that when we put out these free videos a couple times a week, um, even though you're only seeing a little bit of what we do, hopefully you enjoy it and you can use it in your dojo. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great day or night wherever you live.